throughout the camp. So God says, I want you to do it silently. He says, I want you to go around the wall, important now, unitedly. This was not to be Joshua's victory. This was not to be the victory of one person. Now, God could have spoken the word. The man with the sword drawn in his hand, as we noticed last time, could have spoken the word. The walls could have collapsed without them going around at all. And, of course, uh, God could have given the victory to Joshua. Listen to me very carefully. There are few battles that you fight in life that can be fought alone. Some, but few. There are some of you who are facing personal walls that you will never get around, over, or through until somebody comes alongside and you begin to pray together and you begin to yield together. Even though we've got the promises, God says to apply the promises, there must be a sense of unity and togetherness. In fact, there's a verse in Colossians that says, if you want to enter into all of the inheritance that you have in Christ, I'm paraphrasing now, your hearts must be knit it together in love. You can't do it alone. Now that's true personally for those walls that we want to scale. You can't do it alone. Some of you are in a pit and you can't dig yourself out of the pit alone. We can't do what we as a church want to do unless we do it unitedly. But here's the point. God will make sure that we will not do this unless we do it together. But number two, even if it were possible, I wouldn't want it to happen that way. I wouldn't have wanted, if I would have been Joshua, to say, well, you know, why should everybody go around the walls? Why don't we just have a few people go around the walls and they could sort of represent everybody else? Let Joshua and the mighty men do it. No, let the women and children be involved and let everybody be involved because remember, there are few things that can be done personally or corporately that can be done alone. Maybe there are some, but there aren't many. So they did it unitedly. Helplessly, patiently, silently, unitedly, dare I say, thank God, triumphantly. Now we pick it up in verse 20. And, of course, they went around the walls. When the trumpets sounded, the people shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so that every man charged straight in, and they took the city. And they devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. And of course, if you read, you'll notice that they spared Rahab as they had promised her. And they destroyed a lot of good things in Jericho that the people would have loved to have. God says, no looting, no taking. Take the silver and gold to the Lord's treasury, but everything else, destroy it and, and destroy all the people. Now, many people read this and they say, I can't, I can't take it in. I mean, what kind of a vicious God is this? So much so that the older liberals used to think that there were two gods, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Well, you know that several months ago I preached on the topic of whether God is more tolerant than he used to be. And we showed conclusively that the same God in the Old Testament is the God of the New. And furthermore, the judgments of the New Testament are far more severe than the judgments of the Old Testament. All that you have to do is to read the book of Revelation to realize that. What was God saying in this context? This now is from my heart to yours, as everything is. Sin is contagious. It's contagious. It spreads like disease. It spreads like the flu. You begin to have contact with these false gods over here. You begin to compromise with these people who were exceedingly evil into every imaginable form of sexual perversion into occultism and the whole bit. God says, I want you to destroy the enemy because there can be some things in which there can be no compromise. It's hard. But you read the book of Revelation and you discover judgments. Now, of course, the children, we believe, in this context would have gone to heaven. But the simple fact is that God is saying, God is saying, you cannot compromise with sin. It, you know, I don't know about you, but whenever I try, I always think to myself, well, I can compromise with this. And what God keeps telling me is, and showing me conclusively, that it's impossible. 
Yes, my friend, the older I get, the more I realize that God really does desire that we be holy. This is Pastor Lutzer. And you and I have had the experience of becoming involved in some sin, taking some lust, some desire that we want to hang on to, and it contaminates. And later on, we regret it because we know that we have grieved the Holy Spirit of God. I know that those passages in the book of Joshua are very difficult for us to understand, how God asked that the enemy be exterminated. But God was saying in the most clear terms imaginable that if you allow them to live, you'll end up worshiping their gods and you will know that sin has entered into your camp. Today, my friend, as I conclude, let's get rid of sin through confession and repentance. Dr. Erwin Lutzer with part two of Let the Walls Fall, the third message in his series, Getting Started Right, Lessons from the Life of Joshua. Monday, some final thoughts on the story of Jericho. Running to Win comes to you from the Moody Church in Chicago. Getting Started Right can be yours as a six-message CD series. The series is our thank you when you give a gift of any amount to support Running to Win. Just call 1-800-215-5001. That's 1-800-215-5001. Online, go to OfferRTW.com. That's OfferRTW, all one word, dot com. Or write to Running to Win at Box 11174, Chicago, Illinois, 60611. This is Dave McAllister. Is there a Jericho in your life? If so, don't miss the Monday edition of Running to Win.